Boldwood presents A Midwinter Match, written by Jane Lovering and read by Rose Robinson. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. From the You Into Work website. Our aim is to get you back into the workforce. With our help, you will be able to prepare an up-to-date CV highlighting your capabilities and expertise, apply for jobs suited to your qualifications, and widen your scope of suitable workplace experiences. Our confidence coach, Ruby Oldbridge, will work with you to make you the best version of yourself that you can be and will help you boost your self-esteem to enable you to showcase your skills in a marketable way. Ruby is a qualified therapist who also offers talking therapies for those who feel that their mental health is holding them back from gaining the workforce experience that they would wish to have. Ruby made me feel that I could do anything. Mike Williams, out of the workforce for three years, now deputy manager at low-cost stores Haxby. Every time I spoke to Ruby, I came out of that room feeling a million dollars. She's just so upbeat that she makes you believe in yourself again. Adila Kamal, returning to work after seven years raising a family, now a customer services manager at Mega Rail Trains. Chapter One I was up a ladder painting the front room when Gareth came in. Hey, Rubes. He put down his bag. Sorry, but I've been called in. I've got to fly to Belgium this afternoon, sort out a problem with some rotary flanges. I had no idea what a rotary flange was, but I didn't think I liked the sound of it. But you've only been back a week. I climbed down the ladder, hands slippery with September morning. What do you think of the colour? Bit blue? It's great. He kissed my cheek. And yeah, sorry, but it's work. How long will you be away this time? Gareth fitted big, expensive machines all over the world. It meant that he flitted in and out of my life like a crane fly, all long legs and more noise than you could imagine one creature making. Now we'd bought a house, I'd fondly imagined he'd want to settle down a bit, but there was no sign of that happening yet. No idea, Ruby love. Now, do you want to give me a proper send-off or what? But I'm covered in paint. No worries, he smirked at me. We could make a blue movie. Get it? Blue? Movie? Well then, it wasn't his intense wit that had attracted me to Gareth Williams. And to be honest, when he made jokes like that, I found it a bit hard to remember just what it had been. Meet you upstairs in five. He sprang out of the room and I heard the clump as his feet went up the as-yet-uncarpeted stairs. The door to our bedroom slammed open and there was the sound of the bed springs twanging as he threw himself down on the mattress. I carefully covered the paint tins, smiling to myself. Gareth was just so... so enthusiastic. A bit unreconstructed, sure, but I was working on his rough edges with the sandpaper of my own upbringing. I had no idea how a man born 30 years ago could have all the attributes of someone who'd grown up in the 60s, but... He did. Good job he was so bloody gorgeous. I noticed his bag where he'd dumped it in the doorway. He would have made his usual attempt at packing, but I bet he'd forgotten all the clean shirts that were hanging behind the kitchen door and the underwear he'd pulled out of the tumble dryer and left in a pile on the floor in the utility room. I didn't want desperate phone calls at two in the morning again because he couldn't find his Ted Baker shirt or his favourite Tweety Pie boxers so I unzipped the bag to check he'd put them in. He'd packed more pairs of jeans than one man with only two legs could ever need. I sifted through, looking for the shirts, which, of course, weren't there, and was just about to shout up to him that he needed to repack, when my fingers felt something hard. A box. A jeweller's box. I smiled to myself as I pulled it out. Gareth had never given me a goodbye present before. To be honest, he'd never been big on presents, but his whole family weren't really into gifts of any kind. Christmas in his household had been more about the TV and the food. It was another thing I'd been working on, and with some success by the look of this little leather box. The thumping of my heart was mirrored by the thumping upstairs as Gareth strode to the top of the stairs. Hurry up, Rubes, it's getting cold! Was it a ring? 
was he going to propose? How did I feel about that? My mind was going at a million miles a second. Marry? Gareth? For a fraction of a second, I had the image. Church, white dress, my mum looking cynical, my sister looking relieved. Then on to a living room crowded with children, Gareth sitting in the middle in front of the TV while the children played. Was that what I really wanted? I pulled a little catch to open the box, wondering how much this had cost. Even the box looked expensive, and Gareth usually balked at buying takeaways. Your cooking is much better than any takeaway, Ruby love. It would have carried more weight if he'd actually helped wash up afterwards. Inside the box, nestled on a pillow of sumptuous red velvet, was a pair of gold earrings, and in the lid of the box was a note in Gareth's slightly childish handwriting. Remember that pair you wore that night in Brighton? I'll never forget taking them out with my teeth and getting one stuck in that lacy bra of yours. Promised I'd buy you a new pair, didn't I? Can't wait to do that again. My hands were sweating, and my hasty lunch of tuna on toast was threatening the back of my throat. I sat down hard on the bottom rung of the ladder, the box between my fingers and the smell of paint scalding the inside of my nose. Upstairs, the bed springs twanged again, a tiny orchestra tuning up for sex. There were three things wrong with this little gift. One, I wasn't sure any of my bras could have been described as lacy. I favoured the more sturdily constructed variety. Nobody needed their nipples rasped whilst dashing to answer the phone, as I repeatedly told Gareth, who repeatedly treated me to Anne Summer's finest. Two, I didn't have pierced ears. And three, I'd never even been to bloody Brighton. Eight months later. I parked my car in the U into work car park, which seemed busier than usual. The offices were neatly located behind York Minster, which sat in the winter sunlight, half yellow where the sun struck the stone, but with the shaded half dark and sharp with shadows. I wondered if they were holding an event and had, once again, failed to point out that our car park was out of bounds. Religion seemed no protection against dreadful parking, and every space in here was rammed. As I locked my car, I looked around. My usual space was occupied by a discovery. Most of the other cars were high-end brands too. Maybe God had seen fit to bestow nice car ownership on his followers. I looked at my ten-year-old Skoda and wondered if it was too late to have a sudden Damascene moment, then looked at where my mirror had scraped along the wall in the tiny space I'd had to squeeze it into. Atheism was still paying off. Halfway across the car park, I met Priya, who'd obviously been waiting for me and had bustled her way out to intercept me before I got through the door. Ruby, there's a meeting. I shifted my car keys from hand to hand, almost as though I expected her to attack me. It was most unlike Priya to come out from behind her desk, which held her computer, her phone and most of the major food groups. OK, in the Minster. This would be the point where I would be called upon to make tactful phone calls and to use my skills at people management to cheerfully shivvy the enthusiastic and blessed worshippers to park elsewhere. I looked back over my shoulder to where my car was quietly rusting. If Ed had any sense of occasion, it would have chosen this moment for the bumper to detach and crumble onto the tarmac. No, it's us. She was shuffling from foot to foot. They're merging us. She set out towards the building. They've decided to cut costs by putting us in with the back to employment lot. I shuddered as though my grave had been stomped on. The back to employment group was our rival, our bogeyman. It was what we threatened underachieving employees with. They did the same sort of thing as us, getting the long-term unemployed back into work. But they did it with less finesse and encouragement and more punitive measures. They also looked like the sort of people who went on team-building exercises and called one another guys. I stopped walking. The full car park suddenly made sense and I felt the clamps around my ribcage start to tighten. But I thought, I mean... Our success speaks for itself. Yeah, well, apparently there's also talks and it says merger. Priya looked at me. You okay? You've got that face on. I took a deep breath and forced my lungs to expand. 
Fine. No, really, I, I'm fine. Priya lowered her voice. Have you taken your tablets today? You make me sound like I'm liable to lay about me with an axe if I'm not sedated. I took another deep breath. Yes, thank you, Pri. I've taken my tablets today. Ah, those tablets. Another legacy of Gareth's abrupt departure. My anti-anxiety medication. She didn't respond, just opened the door and we walked through into the corridor, which always smelt of illicit cigarettes and frantic repainting. I automatically turned left towards our offices, but she shook her head at me. Meeting room, she said sadly. Oh God, it must be serious. And that's why I asked about the tablets. The meeting rooms were usually only used for get-togethers, Christmas parties, the occasional visiting dignitary or government minister. It was the kind of room that had photographs of local scenes on the wall, as though we may have forgotten where we worked, because why anyone who actually lives in York needs to see the shambles by night in moody black and white shots when they could just go out and see the shambles by night in real life and colour escaped me. The meeting room was a swirl of people, all milling about on the static-filled carpet like restless wild ponies before the roping started. The you into work crowd were grouped around the far end, huddled together and whispering. The strangers were also sticking together, close to the door, presumably so they could make a run for it if we turned out to eat human flesh. They looked cocky, self-contained and confident. The men all wore well-cut suits and shiny shoes, and the women, of whom there were fewer, looked sleek and professional. I immediately felt crumpled. Beside me, Priya adjusted her collar and yanked at her skirt, clearly as uncomfortable as I was. I shuffled my way through the newcomers, who moved reluctantly, and over to my workmates, who were trying to hide their tattily trained feet under tables and were making furtive attempts to tidy their hair. Priya stuck close behind until we reached the safety of our colleagues and turned. It's like a school disco, she whispered to me. If anyone plays Mr. Mr., I'm off. A man stepped apart from the back-to-employment crew and advanced towards us, his immaculately clean trainers raising little sparks from the cheap green nylon flooring like a special effect. He was tall and long-limbed and, in contrast to his workmates, was wearing jeans and a jacket over a T-shirt and his hair was tousled. He could only have said friendly and approachable more clearly by having it tattooed on his forehead. I distrusted him immediately. You're Ruby Oldbridge? He held out a hand. Zach Drew. Cautiously, as though he may explode on contact, I shook his hand, took a deep breath and assumed my usual relaxed, friendly work persona. Hello, I said brightly, without the least idea what was going on. At least he didn't attempt the double-handed handshake because I would have had to kill him. This is all a bit difficult, isn't it? He asked, almost as brightly as me, but clearly with a lot more insight into the circumstances. Oh, I don't know, I said, absolutely truthfully. Priya, who'd been stuck to me like a guide dog, had peeled off and was hiding behind the IT boys. Damn. I'd been relying on her to find a sudden excuse to call me away. The worst thing is that someone has parked their discovery in my parking space. Ah. I took the brightness down a notch. Oh. It's yours, isn't it? I didn't even need to make it a question. Well, I guess they're going to have to work something out, re the parking, for the time being. Zach Drew a name that sounded perfect for making things out of sticky back plastic and PVA glue on children's TV, gave me a slightly cooler look. If we're all going to be working together, until they sort out who's going to have to go. The thought that a merger may mean losing my job hadn't even occurred to me. I was the only person in the building who did what I did, who could do what I did. I counselled, cajoled and encouraged our clients. I'd personally boosted our success rate from the low 20% up to a near 65% job return. And the clients loved me. Most of them still sent me Christmas cards and sometimes presents. Zach Drew hovered until the management team came in and we all sprang to attention as they started talking. I 
had to admit that the Back to Employment crew had got the whole listening hard, agreeing whilst thinking deeply about what's being said, really down to a fine art. There was a lot of tilting of heads, frowning, slight nodding going on. In contrast, my workmates were all staring at the sickly carpet, shuffling and nudging one another. We looked a bit shambolic in contrast. But then, we'd never done raft building. The upshot of the address was that we were merging to save costs. Governmental directive. As both teams were partly paid from governmental funding, it made a kind of grudging sense to reduce the overlap. But I was still confident that my job would be safe, despite my sweaty hands and the sick feeling that was creeping up my neck. Our unique selling point was that we counselled. Our USP was me, and I was good at what I did. So I had slumped into a kind of hubris-laden, can we all stop talking and just go back to work, fugue, when I noticed that people were walking away. Our leadership team, plus a couple of others who had the well-suited, secure smiles of those whose jobs were not in any danger and were, therefore, probably high ups in back to employment, were looming up to me. I'd been looking out of the window at the sun sliding down the buttresses of the minster, throwing knives of shadow across the stonework when the introductions were done and not paid attention. I noticed that Zach Drew was in tow. Ruby! Our senior leader, Michael, cornered me whilst I was trying to attach myself to Priya and Josh from the front office. Have you met Zach? There was an atmosphere of evacuate the building and defuse the bomb about Michael that I wasn't sure I liked. He was also wearing a smart suit and his grey hair wasn't hanging in one eye. Michael usually looked like a sociology lecturer on his day off. Today, he looked like he ran the place. Yes, I said. I'm parked in her space, Zach said, and Michael nodded. The other two, a woman with a backcombed beehive hairstyle that looked uncomfortable, and an older man in glasses, smiled beneficently. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to give up your space, just for the time being, Ruby. Michael wouldn't meet my eye. This was bad. I wasn't sure what exactly was going on, but it was definitely bad. Well, we all sort ourselves out, what with the others being over from Leeds and not knowing where else to park. But I wanted you to get to know Zach properly. Now he looked me right in the eye. Michael had always left me largely to my own devices. He was happy with our results. He was more than happy with the ecstatic feedback we got from clients. And he was positively overjoyed with our increased funding every year. But now he looked like a five-year-old who had been told that someone is not happy with him and can't work out why. Any particular reason? I eyeballed Zack, who was still smiling and sort of lounging alongside backcomb woman and glasses man, as though they were his parents. Oh, did I not explain? Another slight nervous look. Ah, well, yes, Ruby, you and Zack do very similar work for our two institutions. Very similar. And I'm afraid the new company, which I think we're calling you back to work, aren't we? Another nervous smile at the other two. It's a wee bit clumsy, but we'll work it out. Yes, well, the new company only needs one counsellor. We're moving to a rather more proactive model, you see. He finished as though he didn't know what a proactive model was and was rather hoping it would turn out to be something that featured very thin people in designer clothing. Zack was still smiling as though he knew all this already. To be honest, he probably did. There had been meetings and feedback forms and stuff going on with us too, but it had all been eight months ago, when I'd been too busy dealing with the aftermath of being dumped by Gareth, having to sort out the sale of the house and moving into a shared house with three other people. It had been like becoming a student again, with the added complication of a mortgage. Michael was still talking. Something about Zach and I carrying on working, being given a couple of months and then being assessed on results with the best fit for the new model, keeping the job, and the other being given an attractive redundancy package. I bet that Michael didn't know what either of those things were. At least he'd known what a redundancy package looked like, but not from the sharp end. I'd been left paying off the house debts, so anything less than Henry Cavill levels of attractive just wasn't going to cut it. In essence, we were being expected to compete for the job. 
The very thought made my ribcage ache, and worries I couldn't process begin the familiar cascade. And I'd have to compete against this man, who'd already got a discovery to my aged Skoda. Plus, the bosses from the other company were smiling in a complacent way, as though they had already redecorated my office and moved him in with a kiss on the cheek and an increased salary. I'd be out on the street with the surplus confectionery, whilst he'd have a cupboard full of colour-coordinated post-it notes and neat ranks of A4 pads. To make matters worse, whilst we competed we had to share the office, displacing Priya, who I relied on to be my sounding board, into the tiny office, no bigger than a cupboard, next door. When Zach and I walked down the corridor in the kind of silence that you could have cracked with a spoon, I found Pri already manhandling her belongings out of the door. Don't leave me with him, I hissed at her as he swept inside. There isn't room for three of us, she hissed back, accurately, as it happens. When Zach and I got into the office together, I feared for the amount of breathable air, which was odd because Priya and I had shared for three years without either of us suffocating. But then she was five foot four and Zach topped her by a foot. Quite a bit of which was hair. He had one of those spiked up haircuts that added to the TV presenter look. We shuffled around one another for a few moments. Is that one your desk? He eventually pointed at the desk by the window. Shall I have this one then? He sat down at the desk, which had, until very recently, been Priya's. After a moment, he stood up again, removed a magazine and a bar of chocolate from the chair, put them on the desk, then sat down again. Priya duly reappeared, picked up the magazine and chocolate, and left, walking past me with her eyes very, very wide, which was when I noticed that the magazine was a copy of Your Cat. Zach and I sat opposite one another for a few more uncomfortable minutes. When my telephone rang, I seized upon it as though it were a call from God although he was, presumably, over the road in the Minster and could just have shouted. I answered to hear Michael on the other end, who began telling me that, following consultation, they had decided that it would be a good idea for us to run some getting-to-know-you bonding exercises for both sets of employees. The inverted commas were so implicit in his tone that they flashed in a synesthetic way every time he uttered another buzz phrase. Buzz phrases weren't like Michael. He usually sat in his office drinking coffee and only interacted with us via his PA, who, come to think of it, hadn't been at the team meeting, which was worrying. Michael didn't usually phone us directly either, which probably accounted for his tone of worry. He sounded as though he wasn't 100% certain how phones worked and wasn't convinced that he was talking to the right person. So, I can leave you both to it then, he finished jovially. Sorry, Michael, what are you leaving us to? I wanted to add, and who is us? But it would be Zach and I. Of course it would. There was an awful inevitability to all this. Setting up the exercises. If you run one and young Zach there runs another, well, it will be a chance for the board to see your different approaches. I had no idea why he was trying to make us competing for the job sound like it was going to be fun. Oh, wait. Yes, I did. It was because his job wasn't in any danger and, besides, he could take early retirement any day on an enormous pension and supported by his much younger wife who earned squillions doing something legal. Legal, as in she worked in law and wore stylish black suits and knew her way around canopy fillings and the judicial system. I had a sudden throbbing image of the amount I still owed the bank and shuddered. My breath threatened to stop in my throat but I carefully kept the panic down. Breathe. Oh, yes, that will be fun, I trilled, aware that Zack was watching me over the top of his computer screen. I love those team-building things. I had to dig quite deep to find the reserves of sparkle and cheer, but I did it. Leave it to me, I'll tell him all about it. Using Zack's name would attract his attention, like saying Beetlejuice and I wanted to steal a march in the organising stakes. Oh, Zack's been told, Michael chirped back. He sounded nearly as bright as me. I wondered if he was putting it on too, and allowed myself a second of imagining Michael in his office with the back-combed lady holding a gun between his shoulder blades as he spoke to me. It was his idea, you see. 
very good idea, you must admit. Excellent way to get us all bonding and working together as a team. Going forward, he added, as though the gun had been jabbed in his spine to force him to add the obligatory corporate speak. I raised my eyes from where they'd been scanning the surface of my desk, giving my subconscious a good battering about the mess of receipts, post-it reminders, sweet wrappers and general office detritus, to see Zack still looking at me. I could only see his hair and his eyes above the screen, but there was a definite tone of smiling complacency about both features. I smiled back. I'd perfected the art of smiling with my whole face and looking as though I really meant it, even when I wanted to crack the object of the smile around the back of the head with a plank. It all sounds brilliant. I injected yet more lightness into my tone. I'm really looking forward to thinking up something fun. Pushing the envelope, I added, and then hated myself, but it seemed that corporate speak was infectious. That's the spirit. Michael hung up, leaving me still grinning like the Joker and trying to beat down the urge to set fire to the curtains. Team building thing? Zack asked as I put down the phone. We talked it through before we came over from Leeds. I wonder why they decided to keep you in the dark. His brown eyes continued to peer at me over the top of the screen, focused and sharp. He sounded interested and friendly, and the tiny part of me that had hidden behind my heart was hating that he was the competition. The rest of me, cynically, wondered why he sounded interested and friendly and how much of an effort it was for him to assume that tone. Bit unfair. I smiled with as much mystery as I could summon. We may actually have been told about it all, but anything that had happened during the last stressful months had got lost in a kind of shoot that had poured everything downwards. Feelings of loss, fear of the future, and a financial spiral that had sent me back to my childhood bedroom for a while. My mum had fed me soup and soft-boiled eggs and lectured me lightly, using therapy speak, on equality in relationships, and my dad had threatened to borrow my uncle's shotgun and hunt Gareth down. So much had passed me by, including, it would seem, arrangements for my job. Oh, it's fine, I said breezily to Zack. I do that sort of thing all the time with my clients, so it's just a matter of extending it across the team. A whopper of a fib, of course. My clients didn't need to bond. They mostly needed to get over their fear of the unknown, and whilst building rafts on a muddy pond in November would definitely be an unknown experience, it really wouldn't have helped them much in their attempts to learn to fill in forms and go to interviews. Zack leaned forward and tilted down his screen, presumably so he could see me more clearly. That sounds interesting, he said, leaning his elbows on the desk and resting his chin on his hands. What sort of thing do you do with them? I'm afraid I don't want to answer that question, I said. Confidentiality, you see. I wondered whether Dad's offer of the shotgun still stood and was transferable. Really? Zack frowned. Well, I wouldn't have thought. But then his phone rang and I could drop my face down below the level of my screen and let the bright, chirpy smile slide away from my lips and eyes. Shit. Now I had to think of a team-building exercise. Something original. Zack looked as though he'd learnt his team management skills from a textbook. He'd probably resort to the obstacle course or blindfold end of the spectrum. The sort of thing that everyone would complain about because it meant getting cold or wet or being outside, or, in the case of leading your blindfolded teammate, having to touch another person. I peered covertly at my new competitor as he spoke on the phone. He could, at least, have had the decency to be snide, or to have made carefully angled comments about my office. He could, in short, have made more effort to be the enemy. Instead, he was coming over as open, reasonable and decent, which just wasn't fair. I needed to dislike him. I couldn't compete against a man who was happy and friendly and smart. It would be like fighting for my job against a border collie. Why couldn't he be sweaty and lecherous and eat pork pies whilst reading emails laboriously with his finger trailing across the screen in a greasy smear? And now I had to think up something unique, indoors, preferably sitting down, that would bond two groups together. 
one lot from Leeds, which we regarded as a metropolis only one step away from downtown New York, whilst they, presumably, thought us to be only just moving into running water and not pitchforking one another to death over witchcraft claims. I had to do it to keep my job. That gave me a bitter taste in my mouth. I pushed the fear down for now, knowing it would bob to the surface soon enough. There was not enough weight in the world to submerge those feelings deeply enough to stop them coming back up. To keep my mind off them, I switched to listening to Zack. Zack sounded as though he were talking to a client. Someone he knew well, obviously, from the way he kept calling them Bob, and seemingly talking them down from a bad interview situation. Eventually, he sighed and said, OK, OK, maybe you'd better come in and we can talk about this before you get sanctioned and your payments cut. A pause. No, we're working out of the York office now. Could you get there? The voice at the other end quacked a few times. Sounded aggrieved. Yes, yes, you can get your travel expenses paid. Zack looked up and met my eye. For the tiniest second there was communion, as we acknowledged the way our job could pull us in so many different directions, being encouraging whilst wanting to shout. But I soon looked away. I didn't want to have any kind of fellow feeling with Zack. I couldn't afford to like a man who may soon have my office and my job, however pleasant he may appear to be. Besides, I didn't know him. He might turn out to be awful to his mother or kick kittens when he thought no one was looking or hate midsummer murders. Nobody could be as alertly agreeable as this without it being a front for a seething mass of something. Plus, listening to him talking to Bob, he was being a little bit brusque. People who have been out of work for a long time needed more than those who'd never known a moment's unemployment telling them they just had to buck up their ideas and apply for more jobs and Zack sounded as though he was coming dangerously close to that attitude. Maybe he was going to turn out to be an outrageous bully. I could only hope. When he asked his client to come in tomorrow at three, I managed to stop wondering about him and raise a decent amount of indignation at his attitude. I've got the interview room tomorrow at three. I have a client, I said, when he'd put the phone down with a sigh. Zack blinked. Surely there's more than one interview room. Why? There's only me doing this job. I can only see one person at a time. Why would we need more than one room? He sighed and dropped his head behind the screen. When he raised it again, his hair was less perky, as though he'd had his face in his hands. What do you suggest? I don't suggest anything. It's my interview room. I wasn't keen on this problem-solving approach, because it meant me doing all the work. The room is free in the morning. Why not reschedule? Bob's not a morning person, Zack said heavily, as though this was an ongoing bone of contention. And it isn't just your interview room anymore, and there isn't just you doing the job. We sat in a dry, sour silence for a moment. I suppose I could take my client to the coffee shop next door, I said, when he clearly wasn't going to back down. This wasn't fair. I did conflict resolution with my clients. I didn't need to start dragging it out in my own office with a man who kept smiling at me, even if that smile had faded a bit in the last few minutes. Zack stood up now. His hair nearly brushed the beams of the old building. Thank you, Ruby. If I listened hard, I was sure I could convince myself that there was a tone of satisfaction there, as though he'd known all along that I'd be the one to bend. Another moment of silence. I stared out of the window, to where the winter sun shredded through the bare branches of a lime tree onto damp grass, and took some deep breaths. There is a positive to both of us covering the position, of course. Zack sat on the corner of the desk I was reluctantly coming to think of as his. You can pass any of your really tough clients on to me. The breath I'd started kept going in whilst I thought of something appropriate to say. When nothing had presented itself and my lungs were cracking my ribs, I let it out on a huge sigh. I've been doing this job for seven years, I said, and every year of those seven hung behind the words, keeping them level. I can manage even the difficult clients, thank you. I swept out of the office, 
buoyed up by the tiny amount of implied criticism I could take from his words. He wasn't perfect. He could carry sexist attitudes, chauvinism and an overinflated opinion of his own abilities, just like everyone else. Thank goodness for that. I'd been beginning to worry that there was nothing going on behind that facade of easygoing, good-humoured openness. Now at least I could start to dislike him with reason. I slammed the door to let him know I'd noticed. Chapter Two I sat in my bedroom and stared blankly out of the window. A tiny part of me was comparing the view over roofs and tiny gardens thickly forested with trampolines, goal nets and swing sets with the view from the house Gareth and I had bought. It had been in a village on the edge of the city and looked over fields of grazing cows and newly planted barley. I'd woken every morning to the sound of cockerels crowing and rooks settling in the trees. Here, I woke to next door's motorbike engine and the shouted greetings of people heading to the paper shop down the road. The sense of failure swept over me again. Gareth had gone, and his engagement to a slender and beautiful woman had been documented all over Instagram and Facebook until my friends had forced me to delete him from my social media. The pain of losing him was now more of a dull, embarrassed ache. Losing the house hurt more. I just found the perfect shade of paint for the stairs. I stared at my laptop and the files I was trying to sort through. I had seven clients I needed to contact and three who wanted appointments. Normally I would have rung them now and booked them in, but as Zach seemed to think he had first dibs on the interview room, I didn't want to make any appointments without checking up on the new booking page. And I didn't want to do that during the evening, as Zach would be able to see, and I wanted him to believe that I partied away the night in a whirl of friends, spontaneous invitations, cocktails and dinners, and Christmas markets and skating on frozen ponds with my millions of attractive and very wealthy boyfriends. Basically, I wanted him to believe that I lived in a Hallmark movie that allowed me eight hours of restful sleep a night to be the organised and perky person he saw before him. Besides... I had to work out some kind of team bonding exercise and nothing was springing to mind unless I could find a large frozen lake and 50 pairs of ice skates in central York. Well, it was worth a shot. Rubes, you coming to watch that Netflix thing? Sophie's voice rattled up the stairs to reach me. She was eight years younger than my 30 and made me feel incredibly old. Her life was far more as I wish mine could be with perpetual changes of boyfriend, lots of cute outfits and an insouciance that bordered on randomness. I shared the house with her, Ed, who was dark and serious and worked for an accountancy firm and was saving like crazy for his own house, so never left the premises to socialise, and Cav, whom we rarely saw. Cav had a bike, and when he wasn't working his bicycle courier job, he was mending his bike, cleaning his bike, taking his bike for a spin or reading bike magazines. Cav was the most single-minded man I'd ever known. In a sec, Soph, I shouted back. I was allowed another short moment of wallowing in what could have been, surely. I often told my clients not to turn their backs on the past completely, to look at their mistakes and learn from them. Unfortunately, the only thing I could learn from my past was not to trust a boyfriend with a job overseas and that pale blue was not a good colour for a downstairs toilet. My lungs cramped in a threatening way. And breathe. When I went down to the crowded living room where the television had pride of place, Sophie had her legs up on the one sofa, Ed was perched on a beanbag, and, to my surprise, Cav was there too, sitting on the floor polishing what looked very much like a wheel. I squeezed myself into a corner of the ottoman where Cav stored his inner tubes, and we collectively watched four episodes of a drama that had been promised to be edge of your seat. Sophie was utterly absorbed and gave us a running commentary of her thoughts, with highlights such as, A woman with hair like that has got to be guilty. Ugh, I wouldn't snog him, he could be hiding anything in that coat. And, didn't she used to be in Coronation Street? Ed seemed to be watching analytically. He'd nod every now and again as though a line of dialogue was particularly salient, and Cav carried on polishing his wheel. 
After we'd finished, we sat and chatted about what we'd watched. Outside the window, I could see frost starting to form, creeping its flowery fingers along the edge of the glass. Cars spat grit along the road, and the lights lined up the bins and walls of the front gardens like rulers. A sudden feeling of almost contentment swept over me. No, this wasn't my lovely little house in the country, and Gareth wasn't upstairs waiting for me. But I was inside on a cold night, with the heating that Sophie insisted on having turned up high, crinkling the edges of the wallpaper. Outside was dark and cold, a place of lonely lights and secretive corners. I was here, surrounded by life and warmth and the remnants of the Victoria sponge that we'd all snacked on during the drama. We were all laughing about the ridiculousness of the plot, of overly handsome actors pretending to be down and outs and hugely dramatic revelations. Even Cav was joining in. I could almost forget the breath-snatching terror that descended over me when I wasn't concentrating. The feeling that the worst was about to happen, that I couldn't stop it, and my life was millimetres away from sliding down the nearest drain. I felt, for want of a better word, normal. Just for this moment, I wasn't looking out from the inside of a box labelled disaster onto a world that made sense to everyone else. And in that moment, I had an idea. Have you sorted your team bonding exercise? I asked Zach the next day as we squeezed ourselves into our collective office. He looked at me with an expression that indicated he was half hopeful that my friendliness was a rapprochement after yesterday's door slam and subsequent frostiness and half suspicious that I was plotting something. Uh, not really. It was the first time I'd got the feeling that Zach wasn't in absolute control of every inch of his life and had a moment of feeling slightly relieved. I thought I might go traditional, you know, spaghetti and marshmallows, who can build the highest tower kind of thing. Usually goes down well. Mmm, marshmallows, I said without thinking, and he grinned. Yes, I found the cupboard. He opened the bottom drawer of the largely disused filing cabinet with his foot. It was rammed full of all the biscuits and chocolate that had previously reposed along the shelves of the big stationery cupboard. The bosses were doing a bit of an inspection earlier, so I moved the stuff in here and locked the door. Told them it was confidential. There was another one of those moments of communion, when we met one another's eyes, and his expression told me that we were in absolute accord with our feelings about the sort of management that does spot inspections of offices. Oh, and by the way, he'd lowered his voice a little now. I'm sorry about yesterday. Oh, yes? I tried to look as though I had been waiting for this apology with bated breath and a cool level of acknowledgement of his transgression. Mentally, I was leaping in the air and cheering at the fact that he felt he ought to apologise. I think I implied that you couldn't handle tough clients. It was stupid of me. I really meant that you could pass all those grim jobs that nobody wants to do onto me. I'm not much good at cleaning toilets, but I have fantastic attention to detail when it comes to whitening grout. He gave me a grin that was so open I could practically see the back of his head. So, yes, sorry about that. I should have apologised yesterday, but you seemed... busy. A polite way of saying that I had avoided him for the rest of the day, unless my presence in the office had been absolutely necessary when I'd made conspicuously frantic phone calls. Oh, bugger. Now he wasn't even the sexist clod I could dislike either. This was awful. Why did he have to be so nice? At that moment, the door flew open, banged off the corner of Zack's desk because he'd moved it a couple of inches to the left for some reason, and Priya stood there. I've okayed it, she said a little breathlessly. We're good to go next week. Zack and I stared at her for a moment. Then I remembered that I'd given her the job of sorting the admin for my team building. That's great, I said. You're leaving? Zack half stood behind his desk. But I thought... No, good to go as in good to go with what we are meant to be going on with, Priya rattled without making eye contact, whilst trying to shuffle back out of the doorway. Sorry to disappoint you, I added. Oh, I'm not disappointed. He gave another one of his presumably patented grins, which made him look approachable and sunny-natured. 
It made me slightly uneasy, mostly because I knew how it was done and did it myself quite often. His phone rang and, broadening the grin at me over the top of it, he answered. Priya was slowly retreating, like an outgoing tide, sliding around the wall towards her tiny room, and I got up and followed her into her tiny office. What's the matter? If we closed the door, my knees touched her desk, so I kept it half open in case of oxygen shortage. Did he say anything? Yesterday? Priya's mouth pulled sideways, and she did a kind of hunch of shame. What about? Her entire posture was shouting that she was humiliated. Pri? You haven't got history with this guy, have you? He's not going to turn out to be the bloke you shagged one night who now knows all your deepest secrets. I banged the back of my head gently against the door. Because that would probably finish me off here. Always with the sex. Why do you always go to the sex? Luckily, the annoyance made Pri stop huddling like a Dickensian miser and straighten up. Come on, is there anyone in this building less likely to have shagged Zach Drew, apart from Karen on the switchboard, whose tales of the failings of HRT are legendary? Well, there's me, I nearly said, but didn't. Yes, sorry, no idea why my mind went there. I stopped banging my head. Priya gave me a pursed mouth look. You know I'm gay, right? Yes, yes, of course I do. I'm sorry. I have no idea why that was the first thing that sprang into my mind. She raised an eyebrow. You look at him and think of sex. Which is a perfectly normal reaction. If you're straight. I moved towards her, so keen to correct her misunderstanding that I bashed both my thighs on the sticky out bit of the desk. No! Oh God, no, Pre, don't. The only kind of matchmaking I want from you are those ones that are covered in chocolate. I absolutely have no intention of any kind of sex with Zach Drew. He's the competition for a start, and for another thing, nobody can be that cheery when they've just been told to relocate and compete for their job. Nobody, unless they're taking industrial strength drugs, I added, and then spared a moment to wonder why Michael was so resistant to drug tests for employees. He's not ugly, though. Well, no, but attraction doesn't work like that. Otherwise, I'd never get out of the house in the morning. Ed and Cav aren't ugly, but I don't want to get into bed with them either. Priya shrugged. So, why are you grinning then? Sorry, just imagining Michael spending his evening smoking spliffs and off his face on cocaine. I got a bit mentally sidetracked. She raised her eyebrows at me. So, I tried to divert the conversation. Why are you coming over all embarrassed when you see Zach? And what is he supposed to have mentioned? She looked at her hands and blushed. The magazine. What, the one you left on your chair? Pre, it was your cat, not Bondage Weekly. I know, but in a way that's worse. I don't want him to stereotype me. You know, typical lesbian who lives with about a million cats. I looked at Priya. We'd been friends ever since we'd both started you in to work within weeks of each other and our friendship had deepened when budget cuts had meant that counselling was forced to share an office with PR and admin. She was short, curvy and dark, all of which suited her perfectly. I was taller, leaning towards plump, and my hair was ash blonde. Well, that was what it said on the box, anyway. I was straight, she was gay. When we'd met, I'd been happily settled with Gareth, and she'd been single and dating. Now she was happily settled with Nettie, and I... well... I was as likely to start dating as I was to create team-building exercises featuring rafts, put it that way. Pre, for one thing, you are a very long way from the lame cliché of a lesbian, and for a second thing, what the hell does it matter what Mr Fly-by-Night thinks of you? Priya looked at her hands and muttered something. It sounded very much like, if you don't keep your job, I have to work with him. Then she raised her head. I can't bear it, being the token gay and everyone smiling tolerantly and sort of patting my head and expecting me to knit for their babies and be all jolly and everything. I stared at her. Do they? Seriously? Even now? She sighed. Yes, give it a try and see. Anyway, I don't want him. 
she jerked her head towards the next door office, to think of me like that. Pity invitations to things because he assumes that Nettie and I spend every evening watching Netflix and baking and talking about our cats. It definitely sounded as though Pre wasn't going to form a neutral zone between Zach Drew and I. She was firmly with me, in the trenches. Ruby, you have got to keep your job, Priya hissed with a meaningful look at the door. I couldn't bear it otherwise.